Um, we have just read the poem, uh, War is Kind, uh, by Stephen Crane. So now, what were your reactions to this poem? Um, hmm. Was it being serious? Well, I'd say just a tad. It was a bit serious, but... Mm. I think it kind of makes light of it, like make light of war and it's kind of like telling them like, oh, don't worry, like this is what they were born for, like this is what they're supposed to do, like, I don't know. You remember we talked about how in uh, romanticism, war was glorified, you know, it was so wonderful to go off to war, you know, waving your flags, you know, representing your country. Uh, and this was before the Civil War, but after the Civil War, people got real, didn't they? And war was not so glorious. So if you look at these two uh, uh, stanzas that are indented, horse booming dr drums of the regiment, you know, that's kind of the romanticized view of war. Um, you know, swift blazing flag of the regiment, eagle with crest of red and gold, all this kind of language is glorifying war. But what do we have left after the war? Uh, we have maidens weeping because their boyfriends are dead. We have babies uh, whose fathers are dead. And we, we have mothers who have lost their sons. And he's telling them, um, do not weep, war is kind. Is war kind? War no. is not kind. Uh, no matter what side you're on or where you are, it's not kind. So uh, he's being um, bitterly sarcastic. It's not kind at all. So sarcasm is, is when you say the opposite of what you mean. And by the tone of your voice, people can tell that you mean the opposite. So it's kind of hard when you're reading poetry to know what the tone is. If someone is, is uh, reading it out loud or performing it, then you can kind of tell what the tone is. But if you're just reading, it's hard to figure out the tone. You have to work a lot harder to figure out what the tone is. You know, it's like when you look out the window and you say, oh, beautiful. You know, you get the idea that the person is remarking how beautiful it is. But, you know, if it's raining and someone looks out the window and they say, oh, beautiful, then you know they're saying the opposite of what they mean. They, they don't mean that it's beautiful. They mean that it's not beautiful. But the only way that you can tell that is by the tone. So the tone here is definitely very negative uh, and it's against war and between, and you know, in most poetry, you have to read between the lines, you know, the maiden, the babe, and the mother, they've all lost someone and their lives are changed forever. Uh, so you kind of have to figure out that when he says war is kind, war is not kind. Any comments about that? No comment. All right, then we're going to move on now to uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Uh, Paul Dunbar uh, was born in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, in 1872. This would be just seven years after the Civil War. His parents, before the Civil War, had been slaves in Kentucky. Uh, so they had been slaves and they had been slaves all their lives and then they had only been free for seven years uh, before he was born and they were determined that he was going to get uh, the best education that they could possibly find for him um, you'll find that paul dunbar uh, is one of the writers who uses dialect sometimes he was really uh, criticized for using dialect and and then later on uh he stopped using dialect um 
but uh, when you try to read the dialect part, um, he he's really capturing the sounds, trying to capture the sounds. Uh, he was criticized, you know, by black people and white people because it made it look like black people were uneducated. So later on, you know, he started using more standard English. But actually, you know, th when he used the dialect, it was actually very honest grasping of the language as it was. Uh, I'm going to read this to you because it's very difficult to read. Uh, and what you have to do is just kind of give in to the sound of it. And, um, and I apologize, I'm probably not reading it exactly, but I probably have more of a clue how to read it uh, than you do. Uh, just because I'm uh, 50 years older than you are. And so, you know, I've actually, you know, heard this. Uh, so anyway, this is an anti-bellum sermon. It's written by um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. You know, in Texas, there are many schools named after Paul Dunbar, uh, especially uh, schools that once were black. You know, uh, not in your time, in your lifetime, but in my lifetime, when I was in high school, when I was just a little bit younger than you are now, you know, there were white high schools and there were black high schools. And, um, and they, they didn't mix. Uh, and then I was in high school, you know, when the first uh, black students were integrated and they didn't do it all at once. Like they just did a few students at a time. So I was there when the first uh, black students came to Sweetwater High School. You know, that day that the first black students came, and I think there was only uh, 13 of them, but there were uh, cars parked all around my high school because people were afraid there was gonna be trouble and they wouldn't be able to go in and get their child out if there was some kind of trouble. You know what, there was absolutely no trouble at all. And, um, the, the white kids and the black kids got to know each other. And we went home and taught our parents that black people are just like us. You know, that's, that's the way it was. Uh, so I've, I've lived through the changes. Uh, and I'll never forget that when I was a young newspaper reporter, I interviewed a, a woman. Um, a black woman that worked at the community center and uh, I asked her where she went to school and she said she went to the 10th grade at um, uh, her school in Sweetwater and then I, I asked her why did you stop at the 10th grade and then she just kind of looked at me with a real sad look in her eyes because she knew I didn't know but uh, when she was in school black people couldn't go past the 10th grade that's as far as they could go. Um, and I didn't know that, you know. And it's strange that I had to find out about it accidentally, you know, because it's not taught. But anyway, this is an antebellum sermon. What does, what does an, antebellum mean? Anybody? Well, let's, let's break it down to the Latin roots. What does ante mean? A-N-T-E. Like ante up, ante. So A-N-T-E is a Latin root. It means before, ante, A-N-T-E. Not A-N-T-I, but A-N-T-E means before. And then what about bellum? What does bellum mean? Before. Good, good. So antebellum means before, war. before the war, specifically before the Civil War. So if you talk about anti, antebellum dresses, then we're talking about, you know, the old dresses of the old South that, that were worn on the plantations, you know, by the Southern debutantes. So antebellum means before the war. So an antebellum sermon. This is a black sermon, so I apologize uh, if if I don't do this perfectly. But anyway, this is kind of what it sounds like. We is gathered here, my brothers, in this howling wilderness, for to speak some words of comfort 
to each other in distress. And we choose this for our subject, this. We'll explain it by and by. And the Lord said, Moses, Moses. And the man said, here I am I. Now old Pharaoh down in Egypt was the worst man ever born. And he had the Hebrew chilling down the working in his own calm. Well, the Lord got tired of his fooling and says he, I'll let him know. Look here, Moses, go tell Pharaoh, for to let them children go. And if he refused to do it, I will make him rue the hour, for I'll empty down on Egypt all the vials of my power. Yes, he did, and Pharaoh's army wasn't worth half a dime. For the Lord will help his children. You can trust him every time. Everything okay, Olivia? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, you know what? This is a very appropriate timing for this poem. Uh, did any of you, you know, right now, because Easter's coming up uh, and last Sunday was Passover, we're seeing all these uh, religious movies right now on TV. Did you happen to see that the Ten Commandments was on TV? And the Ten Commandments, uh, it had Burt Lancaster and um, other people, but it was talking uh, about this very time uh, when Moses was told to lead the people out of Egypt. Uh, anyway, that's what this sermon is about. All right, I'm going to pick it back up. And your enemies may sell you in the back and in the front, but the Lord is all around you for the battle, battle's brunt. They can forget your chains and shackles from the mountains to the sea, but the Lord will send some Moses for to set his children free. And the land shall hear his thunder. Who's Mac at men? It's Mariah. Oh, okay. Great, Mariah. Okay. Let's let's see. I'm gonna stop right here before I get forget. And Mariah is here and Jordan is here. All right, here we go. And the land shall hear his thunder like a blast from Gabriel's horn. For the Lord of hosts is mighty when he girds his armor on. For for fear someone mistakes me, I will pause right here to say that I'm still a preaching ancient. I ain't talking about today. But I tell you, fellow Christians, Things will happen mighty strange. Now the Lord done this for Israel and his ways don't never change. And the love he showed to Israel wasn't all on Israel spent. Now don't run and tell your masters that I was preaching discontent, cause I isn't. I was a judging Bible people by their acts. I was a giving you the scripture. I was a handing you the facts. Cause old Pharaoh believed in slavery, but the Lord, he let him see that the people he put breath in, ever mother's son was free. And does others think like Pharaoh, but they called the scripture liar, where the Bible says a servant is a worthy of his heart. And you can't get around nor through that, and you can't get over it for whatever place you get in, this here Bible to fit. So you see the Lord's intention ever since the world began was that his almighty freedom should belong to every man. But I think it would be better if I'd pause again to say that I'm talking about our freedom in a biblistic way. But the Moses is a coming and he's coming sure and fast. We can hear his feet of trumping. We can hear his trumpet blast. But I don't want to warn you people, don't you get too briggity and don't you get to bragging about these things, you wait and see. But when Moses with his power comes and set his children free, we will pay, praise the gracious master that has given us liberty and will shout our hallelujahs. One that on that mighty reckoning day, when we's recognized as sitters, huh? 
chilling. Let us pray. All right. Through the dialect, were you able to understand the message? Pretty much? Kind of. Kind of? Yep. Yep. Lacey? I said kind of. Oh, okay. Olivia? Yeah, kind, of. <laughs> kind of. Jordan? <coughs> Jordan is not here. All right. Let's see. Jordan. And uh, Mariah? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is Paul Lawrence Dunbar. He's writing in dialect. Uh, the poem is from the viewpoint of a preacher. And the preacher is comparing their situation um, as freed slaves. They are supposed to be slave. Uh, I mean, they're supposed to be free, but in society, they're still being treated like slaves. So he's comparing their situation to that of um, the Jews in Egypt um, before uh, Moses uh, led them out. Um, and Moses led them out to where? Moses led them to Egypt. Yeah. What was the place that they went to? Well, they wandered around on the desert for 40 years, you know, but then they they settled in um, in Israel, in Jerusalem. Okay. Um, any comments or reactions to this? No, ma'am. Okay. Anybody? Any questions? Uh, I've got no questions. Nope. All right. We'll just move on uh, to the next one. Did I still not? Okay, yeah, we're still recording. All right, here's the next uh, poem uh, that we're going to read. Uh, by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. It's called We Wear the Mask. Um, we wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our... Uh, okay, I'm going to mute Kayla because there's too much noise coming from there. All right, we'll start again. Uh, but Caleb, I can still see you. <laughs> All right. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. All right, I'm going to let you all interpret that poem for me. What is the meaning of that poem? <clears throat> Olivia, you want to take a stab at it? No idea? Okay. Well, when they say we wear the mask, what does that mean? Okay, let me spell it out for you, everybody. So, 
the people after the war, even though they were free, they weren't really, um, they were still, they only had jobs as servants. You know, they, they were servants, they were house servants, they were people who were sent on errands, you know, step and fetch it was the name of a character because they were always sent to fetch something or um, waiters. Um, so they were still, you know, kind of like slaves, but they were servants. They were getting paid, but not very much. But, and they didn't like it. They didn't like the way they were being treated. They wanted to be treated like everyone else um, because they were free and they were Americans, but they were somehow found themselves in a subclass of America, but they couldn't grieve about it openly. They couldn't show people that they were mad about it. So what did they do? They put on this, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, you know, and, uh, you know, elevator men or whatever, always so pleasant, always so pleasant, but maybe in the back of their mind, they were thinking, they were thinking something else, you know, the smile that they were wearing and the pleasant nodding in face and obedient ob attitude, that was just a mask. It was hiding how they truly felt. And they had to wear that mask because if they didn't, they would get in trouble. You know, um, there were lynchings. Uh, you know, the last lynching in Texas took place, I think, in the 1920, you know, so from, from the, the last, from the Civil War in 1865 up through 1900 uh, and up through 1950, you know, think, uh, Black people were not getting a fair shake at all. You know, as I said, it was only when I was in high school, 1968. In the 60s, things started to change because Martin Luther King, you know, led people on peaceful protest. But people had been, you know, post protesting underneath that mask for a long time. So we wear the mask. Um, let's read it once more uh, to be sure you get the meaning of this. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. Guile means trickery, lying. With torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. You know, like, oh yes. But inside, oh yes. Why should the world be overwise? Why should they see how we're feeling? In counting all our tears and sighs. Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile. Beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. You know, let the world think we're happy, but we're not really happy, you know, but we have to hide it with this mask. So do you get it now? If I ask you what it's about now, uh, what could you tell me? Um, you could say like they're putting on a fake face to try and just get by until things get better. Good. That's perfect. Yeah. Good. All right. We have one more poem uh, to look at today. Um, it's also by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. It starts with the title is Sympathy. It's on the same page. And notice uh, that line, I know what the caged bird feels, alas. Does that line ring a, a bell anywhere? No, you know, some people 
when when they're writing poetry, then they borrow a line from another poem, kind of as a tribute to the poet who originally wrote it. So maybe you don't know that Maya Angelou was our poet laureate in the United States, and she read uh, her poems at Obama's inauguration. And this is her, she has a poem, and the title is, I Know What the Caged Bird Feels. What does that line mean? I know what the caged bird feels. Like feeling trapped, maybe? Uh, exactly, yeah. A bird is trapped in a cage. Uh, black people at the time, they, they were trapped. They couldn't, they couldn't really, um, you know, have the same freedoms as everyone, and they couldn't really break free. You know, they were still kind of under bondage. This is I'm stuck. Yes, yeah. Uh, this was written in 1897, and then Maya Angelou wrote hers. You know, in the last uh, 40 years, sometime. Um, her 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 book of poetry was called "I Know What the Cage Bird Feels." So that's a literary allusion. Her poem is pointing to his poem. I know what the cage bird feels, alas, when the sun is bright on the upland slopes, when the wind stirs soft through the springing grass, and the river flows like a stream of glass, when the first bird sings and the first bud opes and the faint perfume from its chalice steals, I know what the cage bird feels. I know why the cage bird beats his wing till its blood is red on the cruel bars. For he must fly back to his perch and cling when he fain would be on the bow a swing and a pain still throbs in the old, old scars, and they pulse again with a keener sting. I know why he beats his wing. I know why the caged bird sings, ah me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, when he beats his bars and he would be free. It is not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the cage bird sings. Yeah, actually her title was, I know why the cage bird sings. I told you wrong. It's I know why the cage bird sings. So all of these, of course, or drawing an analogy between an imprisoned bird in a cage and black people in society at the time that this was written and and actually for for many years later um i know why the cage bird sings you know the word sing could be metaphor for writing um, um, so let's go to that second stanza. I know why the cage bird beats his wings. What does that mean? Yeah. I can't hear. Sorry, Olivia, I couldn't hear you. Go ahead. Um, it could mean that he's like trying to get out. Yeah. Free. Yeah, trying to reach his freedom. Yeah. Good probably trying to force its way out if it can. Right, yeah. Um, all right, so um, the title of that poem is Sympathy. It's written uh, by Harriet Beecher, Harriet, I'm sorry, it's written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Uh, at the next class, uh, one week from today, uh, we're going to do our last a story in realism, naturalism, 
and that's a Jack London story to build a fire. Um, so please uh, try to read that uh, before you come to the next class. Uh, we won't be reading it. We'll just be discussing it. And um, let's see. Uh, you know, um, try to get that um, realism paper in as soon as you can. Um, and let's see. Oh, I don't have my laptop here. I wanted to. Um, get it in as soon as you can. Do you have any questions about deadlines? Or, by the way, uh, this probably doesn't apply to anyone here. I certainly hope not. But um, the last day to drop a course is April 17th. The deadline was extended until April 17th by the registrar. So um, the people I have not heard from at all who have not done any work uh, since spring break, uh, uh, I'll be forced to drop those people. So everybody needs, if you have friends in this class, you know, uh, and if they uh, want to continue in the class, they've got to check in. You know, they can still get their work in. Um, uh, I'm being more flexible with the deadlines. The main thing is for you to get the work done, uh, you know, so that you can finish the course. But um, the people that I have not heard from uh, since before spring break and who have not turned any work since then, uh, they'll have a failing grade and excessive absence. And if I haven't heard from them, then uh, it's better for them to get a W than an F. So if you know any of them, um, please let them know. They need to check in with me. Um, and, and also, uh, I'm glad to help them catch up or whatever they need to do. OK, uh, we're still uh, in realism, but we're on the tail end of realism. We've just got one more classroom uh, that's going to that's gonna be uh, to build a fire. Uh, and then after that, the next reading assignment is going to be modern poetry. So those poems go pretty fast, uh, uh, but we'll spend, you know, uh, two or three classes on modern poetry. I'm going to try to get all of your assignments up this week. Uh, I tried to do it this weekend. I just couldn't get it all done um, so that you'll know what's coming. Are there any questions about anything? Did you ever find your wedding ring? No, I didn't. And now I'm not wearing a ring at all because the one, the, the pearl ring that I had, it's just too hard to wash my hands constantly. So I'm not wearing anything. But I have a given hope that it'll show up somewhere in my office. I, Because I think if I'd been walking down the halls, I would have heard it bounce. You know, but in my, my office is carpeted. My office, not this office, but my other office is carpeted. So I, but you know, people like even Caleb went in and turned it, turned the room upside down to try to find it, but he couldn't find it either. But maybe there you was know, no hint of it anywhere. There was no yeah. hint of it anywhere. Yeah. So maybe it just fell into the middle of a book or something, and I'll find it someday. Thank you for asking, Olivia. That's very sweet of you. Any other last minute comment before we hang up? All right, I'm going to stop recording then, and then I'll shut down the meeting. Bye, everybody. Thank you for showing up today. Bye. Have a nice day. Okay, you too. Bye.